If you're interested in learning more about high availability switching with SRX series devices, grab a seat in our Juno Security course. For full details, just visit juniper.net slash courses. And when you're in class, you'll want to pay close attention because this subject appears on the Juniper Network Certified Specialist Security Exam. Now let's get to your learning bite. Welcome to Juniper Learning Bites. My name is Zach Gibbs and I'm a content developer within Education Services inside of Juniper Networks and today we will be discussing the high availability switching with SRX series devices learning byte. Alright so at this point you probably understand and know that layer 2 switching along with layer 3 forwarding is supported for a single SRX series device and what we'll talk about here is how that is expanded, that feature is expanded to a chassis cluster for SRX branch series devices. Now one caveat to point out that we have here on the slide is that this layer 2 Ethernet switching is not supported for uh, SRX 100 and SRX 110 but it is supported for all other branch SRX devices such as the 240, the 550, things like that. And then also family Ethernet switching is only supported for local interfaces. That means that you're not going to be able to configure family ethernet switching on a wreath interface for example it needs to be a local interface like what we have here we have this user directly connecting in and this could be through a switch we could have the user switch then connecting into node zero and same with these other guys here and then something else I want to point out is that when we do this we configure layer 2 ethernet switching with a chassis cluster all the device you know the, in these uh, interfaces here are considered a single layer 2 domain now, don't worry, that doesn't mean that we can't have multiple different VLANs to split up that layer 2 domain even further. We can do that. You know, in this example here, we have all the users in the same subnet. They would just be able to communicate over layer 2. But we could have these users split up into different VLANs, and we'll see that in the demo here in a second. And then the other thing I want to point out, I want to point out the interconnecting interfaces. With a standard chassis cluster, we have FXP1, which is the control link. We have the fabric interfaces, which is the data link. And then to enable layer 2 Ethernet switching, we have an additional interconnecting interface called the SWFAB interface. And that stands for switching fabric. And that allows for the layer 2 communication to happen across the nodes. Uh, that is passing layer 2 frames, uh, layer 2 protocols, things like that. And we're also going to have a probe that goes across this SWFAB link, much like the fabric link, that will check to make sure that the interface is up and functioning between the two nodes. Alright, so let's talk about configuring. Uh, when configuring a chassis cluster for layer 2 Ethernet switching, the very, very first thing you have to do is create and connect the SWFAB interfaces before you configure anything else layer 2. What does that mean? Well, it means that we don't want you configuring all the layer 2 interfaces, VLANs, other things like that committing it and then later going back and configuring the SWFAB interfaces. You're going to have unpredictable behavior. It might work, it might not. Highly recommend you configure the SWFAB interfaces first. Now that doesn't mean that you have to configure the SWFAB interfaces, commit it, and then go on with the rest of your configuration. If you have no layer 2 configuration, you could configure the SWFAB interfaces and also the other layer 2 configuration at the same time, then commit it. We just don't want you configuring those other layer 2 features, committing it, and then going back and connecting, configuring the SWFAB interfaces. That's where you're going to get your problems. Okay, so with that, once you configure the SWFAB interfaces, you then go configure your other layer 2 switching parameters, such as your switching interfaces, VLANs, VLAN interfaces, layer 2 protocols, and so forth. Alright, so here is our diagram. It might seem like it's kind of squished to the left a little bit, and that is by design because I'm I squished it to the left so we could fit the CLI on the screen at the same time and still be able to reference our diagram. Alright, so a few things I want to point out here. First, let's talk about the interconnecting uh, links. Well, this is the control link, FXP1. I didn't label it. The diagram's busy enough as is. Then we have dual fabric links. and That's for redundancy. And then we have dual SWFAB links. So switching fabric links. And that provides redundancy for the switching part of it. 
Now, something I do want to point out here is if you lose the fabric links, it's catastrophic for the cluster. The backup node or the secondary node for redundancy group zero goes into the disabled state. So basically node one in this example would go into the disabled state. You lose both switching fabric links. All that happens is these two nodes separate into separate switching domains, Ethernet switching domains. The chassis cluster remains up and is functional. And then you can reconnect those switching fabric interfaces and these two nodes go back into a single Ethernet switching domain, so it goes back to normal. If the fabric links go down, you know, these links down here, they go down, node one goes into a disabled state, we have to reboot the cluster to recover. So it's much less catastrophic or much less dramatic to have the switching fabric interfaces go down. Okay, so something else I want to point out, we have the different PCs. We have the different hosts, PC1, 2, 3, and 4. Notice that PC1 and PC4 are in the same subnet, and they also connect to the blue VLAN up here that we'll configure. Then PC2 and PC3 are in the same subnet, which is a different subnet than PC1 and PC4, and they connect into the red VLAN. And notice how PC1 connects into the blue VLAN on node 0, PC4 connects into the blue VLAN on node 1. Similar stuff for PC2 and PC3. That's by design, so we'll have to use that SW fabric link, that switching fabric link, to communicate between hosts on the same VLAN. Then also we have a wreath interface up here connecting to the internet and a web server that we'll be able to test the connectivity with between that and the host as well, the different host devices as well. Let's jump to the CLI now. Hour. All right, here's the chassis cluster. I'm gonna run a few commands, few chassis cluster. The show chassis cluster ethernet switching status command. This will show the regular chassis cluster information. We can see that we have our different redundancy groups. Everything's looking normal there. And then we also have the Ethernet switching status. Probe state is down. Both nodes are in separate Ethernet switching domains. That's expected because we haven't configured Ethernet switching yet for this cluster. Then I also want to show you the interface. With the interface parameter, we have SWFAB0 and 1. No physical interface is applied. And then the statistics is another great command, adding that parameter. So probe state down. Nothing sent, nothing received no errors. That's expected. So I'm going to jump into configuration mode. I'm going to use the shared parameter so that way I can commit the configuration no matter which hierarchy I'm at. And then I'm jumping to interfaces and configure the SW fab interfaces. Giggy4, you know, this is the, since we're configuring SW fab0, this is for node 0 and Giggy5. So those are the interfaces associated with node 0. Let's configure SWFAB1. Those two interfaces there, and then we can configure the uh, Ethernet switching interfaces as well. And I'm just going to copy that. Configuration to the other interfaces we need. And then we'll commit that configuration and look at the chassis cluster switching status after that. All right, let's check that uh, chassis cluster Ethernet switching status. And this is good. See that uh, Ethernet switching status probe is up. Both nodes are in a single Ethernet switching domain. That's what we want to see. Let's look at that interfaces command. We can see the dual links for the switching fabric interface are there. Then let's look at the statistics. This is awesome. Probe state is up, probe sent, probes received, no errors, everything's looking good. So let's go ahead and jump to the host device. And this is a, a Junos device with multiple routing instances to simulate those hosts. And then I have static mapping, so I don't have to type out the IP address. I can just type out the host name that I've configured. So I'm going to ping PC-4 from PC-1. They're in the same subnet. That works awesome. No problems there. All right, so let's try to ping PC-3, and this will fail, or excuse me, let's do two. Yeah, it would work with three as well, and this will fail. No problem. This is supposed to happen. They're in separate subnets. We haven't configured any layer three VLAN interfaces to allow that communication. So let's jump back to here, and let's configure the VLANs and the other stuff we need to allow that communication. So first, let's configure the VLAN interface. Configure unit one for the blue VLAN and then we'll configure 
unit two for the red VLAN. All right, then let's jump to VLANs. Let's configure the blue VLAN first. Let's configure the interfaces that we need under that VLAN. Let's set the L3 interface, VLAN.1. We configured that just a few seconds ago. Then set the VLAN ID. We'll just use 100. Configure the red VLAN. Set interfaces that we need. It's going to be Gigi 14 and Gigi 5014. Then set the L3 interface. It's going to be VLAN.2. Then set the VLAN ID. We're just going to use 200 for that. Then last but not least, we need to configure the security zones or add those VLAN interfaces into security zones. Start with blue interface VLAN.1. And then we'll configure red. Now, it's going to take a second here to explain why this is important. First of all, it's important because you know you have to have an interface in a security zone, a layer 3 interface in a security zone, to be able to uh, have the interface accept traffic. And then second of all, this is important because when traffic goes from PC1 to PC3, which is in a different VLAN there, it's going to cross an L3 interface, which means we can secure that traffic Notice that when we pinged beforehand, set traffic beforehand to PC1 to PC4 and it worked, it didn't cross a layer 3 interface. And so there was security policies cannot be used to secure that traffic from PC1 to PC4 because they're in the same subnet and they're going to be in the same VLAN, so same type of deal. However, if we ping from PC1 to PC2 or PC1 to PC3, that's different subnets, different VLANs, a layer 3 interface, we can secure that with security policies. Or if we're pinging PC1 to the web server, Again, we can secure that with security policies. And so let's go ahead and commit that configuration. All right, now that commit is uh, complete, let's jump to the host device and let's try to ping PC2 again from PC1. Remember, this did not work beforehand. And success, it works. That's awesome, that's what we want to see. All right, let's run a few other tests. Let's try to ping PC4 again from PC1. This worked beforehand, just want to make sure we didn't break anything. That can happen for sure. And then let's ping PC4 from PC3. Awesome. That you know they're in different subnets there. Where you know the blue VLAN, the red VLAN, that's working too. That's great. And then let's try to ping the web uh, device. Remember, I have static host mappings here, so this is why I can just type a host name, and things are working there. Now I want to jump back to the host to drive home that security policy topic I talked about earlier, and we can see that. Traffic is coming from the host going to the web server. It's going through a security policy, so we can secure that. And let's jump back to pinging PC4 from PC3. And we can see that as well. We can see this. It's going through a security policy. That's that traffic. We can secure that with a security policy. All right, so... I want to do a rapid ping here. Oops. Long rapid ping. That also show you the traffic on the SW Fab interface. And uh, packets are flowing just fine. No problems whatsoever. And so uh, yeah, things are flowing there just great. So we got packets going all over the place, frames getting transferred, things are looking great. Things are working how they should. So that does bring us to the end of this learning bite. In this learning bite, we discussed layer two switching with the chassis clusters, and then we talked about how to configure layer two switching with the SRX series chassis clusters. And uh, as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks certification program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.